There's a part of John Maxwell's book that I want to read really quick on page four. It's in chapter one, and it talks about, chapter one's all about, this book is Developing the Leaders Around You by John Maxwell, okay? Developing the Leaders Around You. And on page four, chapter one's all about the leader's key question, am I raising up potential leaders? Well, I love this story back when he was pastoring a church. I wanted to share it really quick. I've been reading it lately, and this stood out to me. He said, an organization's growth potential is directly related to its personnel potential. When conducting leadership conferences, I often make the statement, grow a leader, grow the organization. A company cannot grow until its leaders grow within. I often, I'm often amazed at the amount of money, energy, and marketing focus organizations spend on areas that will not produce growth. Why, why advertise that a customer is number one when the personnel have not been trained in customer service? When customers arrive, they will know the difference between an employee who's been trained to give service and one who hasn't. Slick brochures and catchy slogans will never overcome incompetent leadership. In 1981, John Maxwell writes, I became the senior pastor of Skyline Wesleyan Church in San Diego, California. He says that this congregation had averaged 1,000 in attendance from 1969 to 1981. And it was an obvious plateau, which is pretty good, by the way. In Springfield, Missouri, we've only got five churches, from what I've been told, that do over 1,000 attendees a week. Only five. Now, he's in San Diego, so that's a little different. When I assume leadership responsibilities, the first question I ask is, why has the growth stopped? I need to find an answer, so I called my first staff meeting. I gave a lecture titled, The Leadership Line. My thesis was, leaders determine the level of an organization. I drew a line across a marker board, and I wrote 1,000. I shared with the staff that for 13 years, the average attendance at Skyline was 1,000. 13 years in a row. I knew the staff could lead 1,000 people effectively, but what I did not know was whether they could lead 2,000 people. So I drew a dotted line above the other line and wrote 2,000. I placed a question mark between the two lines. I drew an arrow from the bottom to the top and I wrote the word change. It would be my responsibility to train them and help them make the necessary changes to reach our new goal. When the leaders changed positively, I knew the growth would become automatic. Now I had to help them change themselves. Or I knew I would literally have to change them by hiring others to take their place. Some of you may have some team members. It's time to cut. You're like, dude, I didn't think we were going to have somebody get up here and tell them to start firing people. Well, if they're the wrong people, they're the wrong people. From 1981 to 1995, I gave this lecture at Skyline on three occasions. The last time the number 4,000 was placed on the top line. As I discovered, the numbers changed, but the lecture didn't. John Maxwell writes, The strength of any organization is a direct result of the strength of its leaders. Weak leaders equal weak organizations. That's what I had four or five years ago. Strong leaders equal strong organizations. We're not as strong as I would like, but we're a heck of a lot better than we were. Everything rises and falls on leadership. So I want to ask you, how are you developing the leaders around you? What are you doing to do that? And maybe there's... The people are the problem. Maybe we're the problem too, right? We can't always just place blame on other people, but maybe there's some of the people problems as well. I really believe that you don't, like, who has, be honest, who has some staff, but you don't really want to delegate everything yet. Like, you kind of hold back from delegating a little. Be honest, right? I, I still do too, okay? It's okay. I really believe if, if, like I had an assistant for years and I didn't want to delegate stuff along the way. The number one reason why you don't delegate is because you don't trust the person you're delegating to. Not fully, or you would. Because the assistant I have now is a heck of a lot better than the one I've ever had. And guess what? I delegate everything. My coffee, my lunch, I don't care. Right? Conversations with big sponsors for our conference, which we're looking for. Like, it doesn't matter to me. Like, she can handle it all. Why? Because I have complete trust that she's proven herself time and time again. 
When you don't delegate, it tells me you don't fully trust the person you're delegating to, which maybe they're the wrong person, if that is the truth. Is anyone curious of whether they should hire an assistant? Like, be honest, like you don't have an assistant, but you're thinking about hiring one, but you're not sure if you should. You're not, you're not sure if it's going to be worth your time, et cetera. Or who has one already? Okay, you already have an assistant. Okay, good. I have a specific formula of how you should evaluate whether you need an assistant or not. This is an exact formula. First thing you got to figure out is how much money do you earn per hour? Okay, so let's just say you make a million bucks a year. Cool, good for you. If you do the math, that's $500 an hour. Well, now let's go all the way down to, I don't know, Mark, what do you think the average median income in the room is? If you had to guess. Yeah, or whatever. Owners, agents, doesn't matter. Okay, so we'll use 100, perfect. So let's just say $100,000 is the median income and we're gonna talk through that number. Well, that's about $50 an hour. 40 hours a week, $2,000 a week, 50 weeks, two weeks vacation, 100 grand, right? So we're at 50 bucks an hour. So let's just say how many hours of stuff that you're doing could you give that assistant? Think about that for a second. Say it's, I don't know, say it's, 20 hours. As a, it could be 10, could be 20, could be 30. I don't know. You could be doing a lot of stuff you should be doing. If you're great at sales, you should be selling as much as you can, right? So maybe it's 20 hours. Okay, take $50 an hour times 20 hours, a thousand bucks a week. If you can hire an assistant for under a thousand dollars a week, you should already have an assistant. Let's just say you get an assistant and they're part-time and they're only $500. They're, they're, they take those 20 hours off you and it only, and it, say it takes them 25 hours to do the work you did in 20 hours, right? Whatever. We'll do the math there, and let's just say that you pay them 20 bucks an hour for 25 hours, right? Well, you just use, you know, it could be whatever. Let's just say you, you pay them $500 a week. If you pay them $500 a week to help you part-time, but it saves you $1,000 in man hours for the amount of money you make, then you just 2x your own money by hiring an assistant. A lot of people, especially over a hundred grand, like I can't imagine not having one, by the way. I just can't. So that's, that's what I call the assistant formula. A couple other ideas of things that we do. We do a monthly, who has sales reps or a sales team or people on your team that sell stuff? We do a monthly P&L on every sales rep every month. Derek's sitting in the back. I know exactly how much money down to the penny that I make on Derek every single month. Well, you're like, well, and, and, and I'm, not, I'm not saying I share the number with Derek. But if Derek's like, well, you're making money on me. Well, dude, if you have a sales rep and you're not making money, what's the point? Derek, if I stop making money off Derek, I love the dude, but I'm not, we can play golf. He ain't working for me, right? Like, that's the point. Also, something we started doing a lot more because the relationships to team members needed to go up on my behalf. I really would just ignore people for their first weeks or first few months and see, ah, we'll see if they make it. That's a terrible attitude. That's just dumb. But now what I do is on their second day of work, I take them to lunch. Because I've learned for me, if, I find, if we find great people, I need to do everything in my power to keep them. I need to do everything in my power to hang on to them. I need to do everything in my power to make sure that I know them as a person. Don't mean I have to go drink with them on the weekends or whatever, but, but I, need to be, I need to have as good of a relationship as I can with them. They need to trust me. They need to feel good about the position they're in. They, we need to have some, some type of a relationship. It can't just be I know nothing about them and I'm paying them. Because guess what? The next person that can pay them more, they will leave. So I've been committed to getting around, like, like yesterday, because tomorrow, I've been told, I don't know if this is true, tomorrow's Employee Appreciation Day, supposedly, okay? Well, I'm not going to be at the office. My wife's not going to be at the office, so we got our entire staff sushi for lunch yesterday because of that. Well, those are things that people care about, right? Those are the small things. Like, we write them cards or when, when we're around the conference or for Christmas or different stuff. We actually give them cash bonuses at, right after our conference every year. Like, we're looking for ways, how can we, we even have an operational pool where we share in some of the operational money that a sales rep didn't sell and it's house revenue. Like, we're always looking for ways to benefit our operational staff as much as we possibly can by doing what's right for them and believing in them and building a relationship with them. Right? Like you got to ask yourself, hey, am, am I doing everything I can 
to retain excellent people because it, it costs a lot to, to, to it, didn't, it, don't, it don't always just cost more money. It costs time and then you lose somebody and then you've got to go do their job. Like I remember several years ago, I would say three and a half, th three years ago, because we have a marketing agency in a different building as well. Well, the company was a lot smaller. I was running, I was involved in the marketing agency. I got really upset. We had some clients that, that weren't happy, et cetera, right? Well, I, got, I took it personally, I got really upset. I got, I got, I got upset at the staff. I got so upset that I kicked everyone out of the office, which is also really dumb, okay, just for the record. But that wasn't the right way to handle it because then the phone rang, guess who had to answer the phone when I hadn't answered the phone in a couple years, which was terrible, by the way. I was like, what did they even say, right? But I had to grow as a leader because I was just, I'll just kick everybody out of the office. I'll do it all. It's not smart, right? It's not smart. I've had to learn to like check my ego and, and, and learn how to like be a better person. It is a funny story though. Hey, if you enjoyed this, I got another one you're gonna love. It's right there, click on it, see you in there. Hey, welcome back to Rising Stars, live every single Friday, 8 a.m. Central Standard Time. Today, I'm excited to go through another chapter of zero to six figures. Last week, I went through chapter one. This week, I'm going through chapter two, and it's a little shorter. It's all about goals and, and